how many people have seen the Finest Hours movie? Oh, so quite a few. So I may burst your bubble in some respects, as I did one gentleman, uh, because now you'll see the slides of the real rescue, and in some cases it differs from the movie, and um, in some areas I'll explain why it differs, other, others uh, not. Because it's interesting, when you, as the author, sign a deal, in this case it was with Disney, you're basically signing the rights away to the story so that they may or may not ask you for your opinion in the production of the movie. I was lucky enough that we had some involvement, but most of the time they, they run with the story and can do what they want with it. So I thought, you know, this is fantastic that so many people have seen the movie, you'll be able to compare it to the slides of the actual rescue. And um, before I get started, um, for those who have not uh, signed up for my newsletter, I uh, do it once a month, so if you're interested, you can sign up. Because my next book is another historical topic that does have a, a maritime theme partially, it's about the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, the maritime aspect is what was happening with the Soviet subs heading towards our blockade. Um, one of the Soviet commanders came about this close to firing his nuclear missile because we were dropping depth charges that we had told the Soviets, hey, these are dummy depth charges, but you need to surface when we drop them. The Soviets never relayed that to their commanders on the U-boats, or I shouldn't call them U-boats, submarines. And um, so they thought they were really being bombed. Uh, it's hair-raising what happened. In the, the bulk of the story is about JFK and the U-2 pilots who were flying over Cuba taking those reconnaissance pictures. Uh, the U-2s fly 13 miles up and most people think that the Cuban Missile Crisis was solved, you know, without loss of life. But the Soviets using a surface-to-air missile brought down uh, Major Rudy Anderson. So we did suffer a casualty. Um, and uh, there was just an article about him that I read. And they made the case that um, his death might have saved the world. And th their angle was, and there is some cred credence to this, their angle is that when Khrushchev heard that we had shot down a U-2 without his authorization, the generals on the ground just did it, uh, that's when he realized this thing is spinning out of control. I need to agree to Kennedy's terms. So it's, it's kind of a, an interesting twist. But with the, with the finest hours, I just wanted to say that the hero of this story, played by Chris Pine in the movie Bernie Weber, I uh, was very involved with the, the book that Casey Sherman and I wrote. Um, Bernie read every single word and uh, proofread it. And uh, he asked me, he passed away right before the book came out, unfortunately. He never got to hold it in his hand. But in an email, he asked me, could you help me uh, bringing back my autobiography into print? He had written it way back uh, in the 1970s, I believe. And um, it, it took me quite a while, but this is the, uh, the result. It's called Into a Raging Sea. So it's written by Bernie, I do the foreword. And it's not just about the, the Pendleton rescue and the finest hours, it's about all his rescues, including the one they allude to in the, the movie, the one that did not work out well and five fishermen were lost. So he writes about what, what really happened there. So at the end of the, the program, I'll take questions and I'll, I'll do book signings. And because I ordered 1,000 copies of these, it's on sale for half price. <laughs> and um, just to keep me, so I don't get too serious with these historical stories that I write about, every now and then I do a fun book. And one that I particularly I'm close to is called There's a Porcupine in My Outhouse. <laughs> this, I wrote it a few years back, but it's a, written when I was 22, or looking back when I was 22 years old, bought a cabin in the northern section of Vermont, very remote area, 
on a, uh, on a small lake, tried to live like a mountain man for a year and failed miserably. And so it's in the theme of like Bill Bryson's A Walk in the Woods. Um, uh, and that's been my, my MO. I'll write two serious books and then I'll write a fun book to give, give myself that break. So we'll, we'll start with the, uh, the finest hours first and then we'll segue to uh, So Close to Home. So this, where you see the, the um, Pendleton and the Fort Mercer, though, that's the area where they broke in half off of Cape Cod, 1952, in this incredible blizzard. And the dotted lines show where they, the two pieces of each ship drifted to, and X marks the spot where was the rescue attempt. Now, in the Disney movie, they only focused on the Pendleton because they didn't want to lose the audience jumping back and forth between two different ships, and I certainly agreed with that. But I thought I'd just tell you very briefly a little bit about the Fort Mercer rescue because it, it was easily as hair-raising as the Pendleton. Uh, there was loss of, of life on the, the Fort Mercer, and the, the beginning of the rescue uh, did not not go as planned. And this is day two of the rescue. So the Fort Mercer rescue spanned 48 hours. The Pendleton rescue, just that one night, the first night of the storm. So this is day two. The seas have gone down somewhat. They're still big. And um, you could see this section of the Fort Mercer is in serious trouble. <laughs> they. Uh, Yet it's still afloat after 48 hours. First, what they did was they sent over a life raft similar to this photo. Four men jumped. They all missed the life raft, and they got swept away. Uh, so you had four deaths right off the bat. And I wondered why, if they landed so close to the life raft, you know, jumping down, why couldn't they take three or four strokes and climb in? You know, I knew about hypothermia. but. It was funny, I didn't get the answer until three months ago. A gentleman, I was doing this program, a gentleman was in the audience, and he goes, hey, that's my father standing up there in the foreground. And he said, talk to me afterwards. I brought a letter from him that he wrote a day after the rescue. And in the letter, he explained why those four men perished. He said, wouldn't you know it, just as we watched them jump towards the life raft, a gust of wind came and blew the life raft farther away. And they couldn't, you know, they couldn't swim 50 yards in these seas and in these temperatures. So even when you think you've exhausted all the research, something new comes up. Now, in this slide, what they did was they had since moved to using a little rescue boat, and they were able to get two men off the Fort Mercer. Then the rescue boat started taking on water because it was very small. So they went back to sending the life raft over. Many of you probably know the old-fashioned technique. They'd shoot the line over to the sinking ship. The men would pull the life raft towards it. They'd tie off the line so the life raft wouldn't float away. And in this picture, you might be able to see there's one line going from the Coast Guard cutter in the foreground to the back of the life raft and another line going from the front of the life raft tied off to the sinking ship because the men had caught the line. The two men jumped. They were able to get in the life raft, but they were so cold and hypothermic, they couldn't manipulate their fingers to untie the line going back to the sinking ship. So they're stuck. And I found a gentleman on board the the four, uh, on the Coast Guard cutter, this is the Yakutat. His name was Bill Bleakley, and Bill said, you know, we weren't sure what's gonna happen next, and really our captain had no choice but to back down, in other words, put the cutter in reverse and hope the line snapped on the side towards the oil tanker, not on the side towards the cutter. And he said, I couldn't watch because he said it was awful. He said, because as we backed down, the tension on the line caused the life raft to go up in the air, rise up, 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 these two guys hanging on for dear life. And he heard a shout because the line snapped. And when he looked up, thank God it had snapped on the side towards the sinking ship. 
So he said, we pulled them in as fast as we could, but by the time we got them to the cutter, they were frozen. And you could see this man there, he can't even move. And so what the Coast Guard did was, some of the Coasties risked their lives tying ropes around their waist, going down, tying these men to them, and then being pulled up to the ship. And so they got these, these were the last two men, by the way. So, you know, I, I just gave you a little overview. There was serious loss of life. And then there's, I didn't even talk about the whole other half of the ship that's in the book. But it was fascinating. He said, just as we got these last two men out, a Coastie shouts, look, look. And he, he's pointing back towards the, the Fort Mercer. And the whole thing reared up in the air. They, a Coastie took this photo from the, a circling airplane and I said, did the thing flop over? And he said, no. He said, it went down like in the movie Titanic, you know, slowly, right down straight. And then he said, you could just see the tip of the bow and it was gone. And he, I remember his comment, he said, think about it. The thing stayed afloat for 48 hours just as we get the last man out of the life raft, it sinks. So how lucky were those last two men? Now, so Disney made the decision, we're going to focus on the Pendleton, and the reason why is the, the Fort Mercer had numerous heroes rescuing the men from the Coast Guard, whereas the Pendleton had a clear hero being Bernie Weber, and they liked that, that angle. So this is the, the Coast Guard uh, station back in the 40s and 50s in Chatham, Massachusetts. Part of the movie was filmed here, but most of it was actually filmed in a giant warehouse where they rebuilt a full-size oil tanker and put it in a giant pool of water with the green wall behind it where they can do the special effects later on the computer. And the first decision back at the Coast Guard Station Chatham when they learned that the Pendleton had split in half, which by the way, for a long time, those poor men on the Pendleton didn't think help was coming because they never got off on May Day before the, the ship split in two pieces. But when the Coast Guard finally learned about it, the decision by Clough, kind of portrayed as a villain in the movie, the commanding officer of the station, in real life, he kind of was in a no-win situation. You know, If he did nothing, his superiors would say, why didn't you try and rescue the the men on the oil tanker, but if he sends out these men in this small rescue boats, just 36 feet, and if they perished, he would have been second guessed, what were you doing risking the lives of our men? So his first decision was to send Donald Bangs out, not Bernie Weber, to go to the bow of the uh, Pendleton. And that's Bangs in the light colored hat, and Bangs was with these three other men. Bernie was very emphatic, by the way, in the book make sure you discuss Donald Bangs. And the reason was, Bernie had a real love of this man and respect for him. And he said, Bangs never got the attention he deserved because he went out to the, the sinking oil tanker and by now it's night. This is the first day now. And when he gets, when he gets to the uh, oil tanker, he, he bangs, circles it, one man comes out on the tip of the bow, jumps, doesn't land near the boat, the seas just sweep him away. He's, he's gone. And he bangs, expects more to come out to be on this half of the ship and nobody else shows themselves. And, and we now know the captain was on this part, Captain Fitzgerald and five other men and they never showed themselves. And it, it will always be a mystery about what happened to them because their, their bodies were never found. And, uh, and Bangs, you know, if nobody else came out, I would have headed back in. You're out in these 50-foot waves in a 36-foot boat. He stayed out there all night long hoping to rescue somebody. Now back at the station, 
Clough learns that the stern of the Pendleton is, is only a mile off of Chatham, and he turns to this guy, Bernie Weber, Chris Pine in the movie, and says, Weber, pick yourself a crew. You gotta go out to the stern. And, and Bernie thinks, this is crazy. This is a suicide mission because my boat's at Chatham Harbor and it has to go over the Chatham Bar. You know, big old waves are gonna hit that shallow water and explode. Bernie did not want to pick the three men that would go with him, and that part of the movie they got right. Uh, he never had to pick, they volunteered. And so in this photo, that's Bernie on the far left, Richard Livesey in the middle, and uh, Andy Fitzgerald on the right. And it's, I've seen this picture so many times, and I always think, these guys look a lot older than they really were. Uh, Bernie is only 24, in this picture, which is when the accident occurred right afterwards. Uh, Richard Livesey was 21 and Andy was only 20. So incredible uh, burden on such young men. And then the, the third volunteer is Irvin Maskey from Wisconsin, who hadn't even trained with Bernie, was waiting to go back to a light ship. So this is their the actual rescue boat um, the 36500, Bernie would have been standing behind the wheel. Um, and, you know, the one part of the movie I, I loved, it's sometimes less is more. And I, I think of the movie Jaws, the first time I saw it, to me, the scariest part was the beginning when you couldn't see the shark. You know, you had that music and you'd see the people swimming and you, you knew, well, in the Finest Hours movie, I like the part where they're in calm water heading out to the bar, and in the background, you just hear, ba-boom, and it's the waves hitting the bar every, you know, five, 10 seconds. And Andy said, I was so nervous, I started to sing to calm my nerves, which I thought was unusual. And they didn't sing the song in the movie, they sang Rock of Ages. And he said the others did join in because we were scared to death. So their path was from the pier at the top of the screen. Bernie's not even thinking of what am I gonna do at the stern of this? He's thinking, how am I gonna get over the Chatham Bar? And um, because it's happening at night, we don't have any pictures of them going over the Chatham Bar, so I asked my Coast Guard contacts, could you send me a photo of what it might have been like? <laughs> Isn't that incredible? Uh, so this was taken out on the West Coast at a bar, and uh, this boat's a lot bigger than Bernie's. Remember, Bernie's is 36 feet. This is the new 47-foot motor lifeboat, and um, it's trying to navigate this giant breaking wave. And Bernie saw this picture, uh, it was either Bernie or Andy, and I remember them saying, that was it. And I said, how'd you know it's dark? They said, we had a little searchlight. We could, as we approached, we could see those uh, breaking seas. Well, I'm gonna go back for a moment. He, a little bit different than the movie, that he tries to get over the bar, the water just crushes the boat on the bow, breaks the windshield, so much water comes in, it sweeps the compass away. Uh, he tries a second time, again, probably because of that earlier failed rescue that he writes about in his book, Into the Raging Sea, the Landry rescue, where five men died and they actually blamed, the Coast Guard blamed Bernie. So he goes from the goat of the Coast Guard to the greatest of all Coasties, goat to goat. And um, he tries again, and the next time, it actually snuffs out the engine. And Andy, I don't know how he did it, but he got down in that engine room, reprimed it, and as the third wave's about to hit, Bernie turns it over, and they go up, 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 and then through that top part of the breaking sea and get through to the other side. So it took three tries. And um, in the movie, they've got uh, one of the men in the you know, that front compartment there. Um, I forget what you call it, it'll come to me. But in reality, he would have never been there. He would have been swept away. They were huddled around 
Bernie, you know, from the, that little protection in the cockpit. So they make it to the other side, and the issue is, well, now what? I don't have a compass. How am I going to find this, this part of the ship? Now, Disney didn't put this in the movie, but Bernie again said, if you're going to write this book, Mike, put in what I'm telling you. He said, I think I was guided by a higher power. He said, because there's no reason we should have found that piece. He said, we were going around in circles in these giant seas. He said, they weren't always breaking, but you go up and then down, you're in the complete dark. And he said, we heard the metal and we went that way and then our flashlight just picked up this wall and then they realized, oh my God, the wall is the, the hull of the ship, right? You know, 50 yards away. So they find it. Bernie's first thought is he sees the Jacob's Ladder come down after for a minute they thought it was a ghost ship, nobody was alive. And when he sees the Jacob's Ladder, his first thought was, I think we're going to be safer on the ship than on this little boat. Let's get my men off and climb up the ladder. And I was laughing, and he said, Mike, I'm serious. And I said, well, why didn't you do that? He said, because men started coming down as fast as they could. They wanted off. And sometimes they'd land in the water and be pulled in. Sometimes they'd land in the bow. And he couldn't just stay here doing the rescue. He'd have to go in, get one or two, pull out before the wave got him, and then come back and get another. And just like in the movie, he's exceeded the capacity of the lifeboat. But he says, uh, we all live or we all die was the line in the, in the movie, I think. And in reality, he, he said something to the effect of, it's all or nothing. I can't leave these men. We'll never be able to get back here. So he's made the decision to get them all. The second to last man is the biggest one of all, like an NFL lineman, uh, Tiny Myers, comes down, lands in the water, very different than the movie, and I think in the movie they didn't want to put this in to keep the PG-13 rating for the kids. They had him just like this, but on the other side of the rescue boat, and because he was so big, they didn't have the strength to pull him in, so Bernie had to hold position too long there. The wave came and slammed into the hull, crushing Tiny Myers. So he was, he was crushed to death uh, by the wave. And Bernie didn't have time to look for his body because the last guy, which in the movie is played by Casey Affleck, is still on the ladder, and he got them. And uh, he did say, you know, on the radio, I'm getting all sorts of advice. And I said, which piece of advice did you follow? He said, none. I turned the radio off. <laughs> I said, don't you get in trouble for doing that with a commanding officer? He said, oh, yeah, I got, I got in trouble. But he said, it was making me nervous, them all telling me what I should be doing. But they make it back over the bar. Again, he says, through no skill of his own, he says, luck. God, whatever, or the tide came up making it easier. We don't know which. Uh, and then, of course, he's home free. The scene in the movie with the lights heading out, the screenwriters asked me, could you give Miriam a more active role in the movie and come up with something? So that's what I came up with, have her shine her headlights out to see so he knows where they are. In reality, that, that did not happen. So that was my one claim to fame of uh, fictionalizing in the movie. Well, when they come back, the people are on the dock, but they're thinking, oh, they've been gone for three hours and they've only rescued one guy. But like a, you know, one of those cars in a parade, a clown car, up, up comes the hatch and all these guys come pouring out. They all have life jackets, uh, freezing cold, and Dick Kelsey was there with his camera, and he captured the next shot, which is my personal favorite. Everybody's left. They've gone back to the Coast Guard station, and Dick Kelsey captures this shot of just Bernie and Irvin Maskey on the boat, and that's Bernie up high. And you, you could see the relief in his face. You know, he's got his hand up to his head. He's just spent. He can't believe that it's over and that they're 
that they're safe. And then they, then they go back to the station where it's pandemonium and the media's there and the four rescuers are assembled for a photo that's Bernie on the left and Andy, Richard, and then Irvin Maskey on the right. But I always like to joke, you know, even a hero like Bernie Weber makes a mistake. He forgot to zip his fly. <laughs> he did have a sense of humor, I must say. And I'm going to close this part of the presentation with one story about Bernie so you know what kind of guy he was. Because I almost feel like his daughter and myself have to kind of keep true to the kind of person he was. He, he certainly never dreamed a movie would be made. He even joked, if one gets made, I want Don Knotts to play me. Uh, but when the Coast Guard realized this is the greatest rescue ever, they call him up, headquarters, you know, the Commandant's office, and say, we're going to give you the gold life-saving medal. We're going to give your crew the silver. Be in Boston on such and such a date. We're having a big ceremony. And he goes, well, maybe you should give my crew the gold, too, because they volunteered. I was ordered out. And uh, he told me, they said, no way. This is how we're doing it. And he said, Mike, I was just about to hang up the phone. I just had a bad feeling about this. And he said, I got my courage up. And I said, well, then I guess I respectfully decline. And they go, what are you talking about? And he goes, if you don't give my crew the gold, I won't accept the gold. And he called their bluff, and all four members got it. You know? So it's beautiful. Just so different than today, where people are trying to take all the credit. He was trying to spread it. And he was right that without the crew, he could not have done that. And, um, you know, the fact that he would even take Irvin Maskey, who had no training on a small boat, no training with him, he preferred somebody who wanted to go rather than one of the more experienced men. He could have said, you're coming. Um, you know, so I always thought Irvin Maskey was an unsung hero for doing this. And his daughter told me, Irvin's daughter said he's passed away. She said, my dad must have gone through post-traumatic stress syndrome because he never talked about this and he never took us near water. He would never go to the beach, the ocean, a river. He wanted nothing to do that it had to have that kind of impact on him. So we switch gears 10 years earlier from 1952, now we're going to 1942 with World War II raging. The U.S., of course, gets involved after Pearl Harbor in 1941. And the slides are going to follow the book. So part one, I'm just going to briefly introduce you to the main people in the book. This is a true, true story. Eight-year-old Sonny Downs and his sister Lucille, they were on this ship called the Heredia. Their dad, who's in this picture, and the mom, all of them were down in South America working uh, for the United Fruit Company on a brief job. And when the war broke out, they wanted to get back to the US. The dad wanted to join the military. But they couldn't secure passage until May of 1942. And then they uh, were able to get on the uh, Heredia, which was a United Fruit Company freighter. And um, at this point, no one, including the Downs, and not even our experts and authorities, believed that U-boats had enough fuel to go all the way into the Gulf of Mexico. They had already been along our eastern seaboard, sinking ship after ship, but none had entered the Gulf. But they were wrong about that. The, the fuel capacity was such that on just, you know, no refueling on the ocean or anything, they could make it across and back. So this was the, the ship that they were on, the Heredia. Uh, there were 60, 64, as they say back then, souls on board. And two U-boats have entered the Gulf of Mexico at the same time in the, the month of May, um, U-506, and I think it was 507. And there, you could see uh, a similar U-boat, 505, which is another sister ship, in the Museum of Science and Industry, I think it's called, in, in Chicago. So you can go inside. 
And, you know, and this little cutout makes it seem spacious, but trust me, you'd be claustrophobic. And they would put 55 men in here uh, with just one bathroom. I mean, these guys were dedicated. Very interesting, by the way, when Allison and I were writing the book, we thought it would be mostly about the Downs family survival at sea story. But we got lucky, and the commander of the U-boat who sank the Heredia, his name is Eric Verdeman, 29 years old in this picture. We found his war diary at the National Archives. So nobody had ever looked at it, still in German. Allison goes down, photocopies the whole thing. We give it to a U-boat expert. They translate it back into English for us, and what a treasure trove of information. Uh, we get his thoughts and feelings. He says things like, at the mouth of the Mississippi River, you, it's unbelievable, they went right to the mouth. He said, water is a yellow color, good camouflage for us because it's not very deep. So in the, reading the diary, we put parts of the diary in the book and oftentimes the chapters alternate and so close to home from the family's perspective to Eric Verdeman's perspective because of his diary. And the, the second U-boat was Commander Harrow Schatz. This guy was really daring and dashing. Um, you'll, you'll read about some of his exploits in the book. So they're kind of a tag team going in to sink as many American ships as they can. In the War Diaries, it's got a lot of good stuff, such as you know where they are each day and what they're uh, observing, but it also talks about the hardships, and Verdeman says it got up to 115 degrees inside the U-boat because of the warmth of the Gulf, and he said people just couldn't wait to the night so we could surface, open the hatch, and get some fresh air. Because, you know, the batteries would generate heat. They ran on batteries when it's underwater, a uh, diesel engine above that would recharge the batteries at night on the surface. So yeah, they had to come up. They couldn't stay uh, below for more than, say, 15, 18 hours max. And they were part of Operation Drumbeat, which was to sink as many ships as they could. And look how successful in the first four months. 170 ships, mostly American, in our patrolled waters off North America. And guess how many U-boats we sank in that period? One. <laughs> so they were, they were winning this battle. And the mastermind was uh, Admiral Dernitz, is the way you pronounce his name. He, um, he and Hitler did not always see eye to eye, yet unbelievably, when Hitler killed himself in the bunker at the end of the war, it was Dernitz that he made the last Fuhrer of the Third Reich. And um, a, a good thing Hitler thought he was smarter than his generals, because Dernitz had a good plan of action. Um, for example, Hitler would always hold back about 20% of the U-boats for defensive purposes. And Dernitz is going, that is a mistake. They should all be offensive. We have this window. The Americans are unprepared. We have Great Britain almost at their knees. Use them all. And he was overruled. They, they didn't leave, the U-boats didn't leave from Germany, they left from occupied France, from these big bunkers in Lorient, France, very well protected. And, you know, when the first ones returned in this Operation Drumbeat, they had a hero's welcome. I recently watched the movie Das Boat, very accurate. Um, that's a good movie in terms of historical accuracy. Uh, the early U-boats coming back, they'd have celebrations, and they were heroes. In Germany, they even had uh, playing cards. You know, like we would have a card for a baseball player. They'd have it for the U-boat aces. Uh, that's how successful they were. So part two, we talk about the sinking itself. So Verdeman writes about his exploits and says the Americans are so unprepared. He, he puts like a comment in there, lights on as if in peacetime. And then I read Schatz's, uh, some of his log and he said the same thing. They just can't believe how unprepared we were. And uh, he said even when the planes come, they, they're 
bombs drop so far away from us, they do do us no damage. These are just some of the ship's locations that uh, Verdeman sank in 506, U-506, all off New Orleans. Uh, they were hoping maybe even clog up this area with sunken ships so that traffic coming down the Mississippi would have, have trouble. And sometimes they were so bold as to come up to the surface in the daytime, which leaves them exposed to our aircraft and fire their torpedoes point blank. Again, because we were so unprepared and ill-trained in the beginning. This is our command center where we were trying to track our ships and where we suspected U-boats were. The Liberator later became effective, but in the beginning, it was just like uh, Eric Ferdinand said, they dropped their bombs too far away from the U-boats. And if you look carefully on this one, you could see a couple Germans there, and um, what they would do is they'd shout, alarm, alarm, and get below, seal the hatch, and then they use a kind of a low-tech technique to help them dive. Every available man would run to the bow for extra weight, and then they'd get to safety down below. So on the ship, the Downs family has no idea that the U-boats have entered the Gulf because the U-boats came into the Gulf of Mexico just um, you know, four or five days before the Heredia entered the Gulf of Mexico. And there's Sonny and Lucille. There's the path of the Heredia. They were supposed to go to New Orleans, but somebody saw something suspicious in the water and they thought, oh my God, could that be a U-boat in the Gulf? We don't know what they saw, so they diverted to Corpus Christi, but the authorities in Corpus Christi said, you can't stay here, it's, our harbor's filled, and uh, Ina, the mother, had a bad feeling, and she's begging, let my family off here, and they said, you're not allowed off, rules are rules, you've got to go on to New Orleans. And she's beside herself. She later becomes quite a courageous woman in this survival at sea story, but um, the captain of the, of the Heredia says to her, don't worry, Mrs. Down, it's only 12 hours steaming through the night. When you wake up in the morning, we'll be at New Orleans and everything's going to be fine. Well, it wasn't fine because 506 had set up shop off the Mississippi. And Verdeman wrote in his war diary, he said, I didn't even have to chase this ship. He said, I could see it coming. There was a little bit of moonlight. And he said, I just set up in one position, could see its path. They were not zigzagging like they should have. And he said, it came right by me. I mean, not far away at all. I'm talking like 100 feet. And uh, they fired uh, the torpedo point blank. Sonny is in the, the upper bunk with his dad in the lower bunk. He thinks when the torpedo hits, they've hit the dock at New Orleans. But his dad is shaking him, going, put your life jacket on. I'm going to get your mother and sister. Don't move. And Sonny said the lights are flickering, and he could see water already coming right into his cabin. The dad comes back. He's got Ina and Lucille. They all hold hands, and they're going to escape the, the ship together. They get, this is Ina, they get to the, the top step, you know, leading to the deck where the, the um, lifeboats are. When the second torpedo hits, that causes a wall of water to hit the family, breaking their handhold. So now you have all four on their own. And as a writer, I'm thinking, wow, what a story. There's four separate survival stories. Of course, for the family, it's a disaster. You know, they've... They're separated and the children are on their, on their own. So I always thought this would make a great movie because some of it's told from a child's perspective, particularly Sonny's. And Ina's story is quite courageous. The reason we know quite a bit about her story is we worked with family members of the Downs family and we thought we had everything, but I'm so glad we kept digging, calling distant nieces, nephews, and sure enough, a niece said, 
you know, I do have something in the attic, a, a box my mother handed down to me, and in that is a little um, audio cassette, and it's just labeled, I know, why don't I listen to that? <laughs> and she calls me back, she goes, it's Ina talking about what happened when the torpedoes hit. So we had it firsthand from Ina, it was amazing. And she said, I thought my family was dead, it's night, I drifted far from the ship, I'm crying, I did have a life jacket on. She said, in the morning I see uh, two sailors on some broken boards, you know, must have been from the ship. So of course, she wants to get out of the water, even though it's say 70 degrees, it will still kill you. The hypothermia will suck away your body temperature. Uh, so she swims over there to get on the, uh, the board and she said one of the men on the board was naked and he gets off because he doesn't want to be seen. So she climbs up and she goes to him, get back up here, this is no time for modesty, we'll all die of hypothermia. And he goes, no, ma'am, I'm going to stay here. And he's holding on. And in the audio tape, she said, three hours go by. And this guy's turning blue in front of me. So I figure I'll call his bluff. And I say to him, if you don't get up here now, I'm leaving. So you got to get up here. And he goes, no, ma'am. And what does she do? She swims away. I couldn't believe it. I would never leave that board. If I'm in the open ocean, and there's two other people, I'd never leave that group, but to save his life, and she thought maybe she'd bump in or find a family member, uh, she leaves the board and goes back into the ocean. And um, it, it's just an amazing story because she said at 2 p.m., I said the first swear of my life. She was a deeply religious woman. And uh, you hear her describe uh, the sharks coming. And she said they, they circled me for quite a few minutes and then one darted in and bumped me. And she said, I think the reason that I survived is just before I put uh, my life jacket on, I put on my heavy wool coat that came all the way down past my knees. So she said, I was able to draw up my feet into it. And she said, that was like this protected covering. And she thought, if, it, if the shark had bumped her and felt skin or flesh, it might have attacked, but it bumped into the wool coat. And she said another one did the same thing, and then after a little while, they left. Uh, so just an amazing uh, story. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Lucille's story. I won't say too much about Sonny's, because his is the bulk of the book, and um, I, I, you, know, you don't want to give the story away. But Lucille got very lucky. She um, found herself swept away from the family, but still on board the ship. And the second mate, Roy Sorley, finds her you know, after the torpedoes hit. The ship is not sunk yet. It's at an angle. And he takes her under his wing and says, we have to jump or we're going to get sucked down. And he says, and we could be strafed by the Germans which he was incorrect about that. The Germans did not strafe survivors. The Japanese routinely did, but the, the Germans had a code of conduct that they wouldn't do that. So he says, on the count of three, we jump. And they jumped. And um, she wrote in her, her letter, she had several letters. She said, Roy was shouting at me, quit stopping, keep swimming, or you'll get sucked down. And he'd say, why are you stopping? And she shouts back, because my britches are falling off. <laughs> and and um, he said, well, you got to get away from the boat. And they did. And they found two other sailors. They located a hatch cover. And Roy was able to put her on the hatch cover. So in a sitting position, but her lower half of her body, the hatch cover is a little bit underwater. It's, and the lower half of her body is in the water. So there's Roy on the right. He was from Linfield, Massachusetts. and he. He's on the right in that picture of the two men as well. We were able to track down his son, and his son said, my dad would never talk about this incident. He said, I knew about it, because on our mantle was the Merchant Marines Mariners Medal that he was awarded. But like so many people of that era, didn't want to talk about it. And so Roy's in the water. She's on the hatch cover. 
And of course, you know what happens. The sharks come. The first inkling Lucille has is a shark apparently rubbed her, you know, went grazing by her feet and rubbed up against it, which is kind of common. I mean, I've done seven survival at sea books, and the survivors say oftentimes the, the sharks will batter the life raft and things like that. And so she goes to Roy Sorley, Mr. Sorley, quit tickling my feet. <laughs> and he doesn't want to panic her. He saw the shark go by. He goes, well, how about if I tickle them every now and then because you're falling asleep and you need to be awake to wave the white little sheet or towel because help will come. So in her letters, she said, I never knew the sharks were there. He kept it from me all that time while he's in the water and uh, he left me on the hatch cover. When he got out of the water, by the way, at the end of this rescue, he was just covered in welts being stung by jellyfish. And again, she said, I never even knew. He kept his mouth shut. And uh, you'll read in the book, he did little things to keep her spirits up because she thought her family was dead. Well, this is the picture that ran a week later. Um, a week because there was censorship. You, you couldn't announce what happened at sea for a certain amount of days until all the authorities did all their investigating, got what information they had. And I like the, the picture so much, we tracked down the original. And uh, it's just this great picture because all four survived. Uh, remarkable how Sonny survives. Um, talk about some weird things. But um, Ina has the patch on her eye because so much oil in her eye. She did later regain her vision. And we decided in the book, because so many people in my other book said, I like those little epilogue parts about what happened to people later. And um, so we decided to do something more than an epilogue, follow the family after the attack, and follow Eric Verdeman. So part three picks it up, and Verdeman leaves the Gulf and uh, manages to sink three more ships on the way out with his deck guns. He's out of torpedoes. Gets back to France, gets two weeks off, and sent right back out to sea. And he becomes involved in one of the strangest incidents in World War II, where Commander Hartenstein, a German U-boat commander, sees this British ship. Uh, this was a giant ship, 3,000 passengers. Puts two torpedoes in it. The ship sinks. And uh, again, the Germans don't strafe people in the water, but they don't rescue them either. He hears shouts for help in Italian, and he realizes, oh my god, there must have been Italian POWs on this ship, which there was. So he, whatever, however their communication was, it must be by code, by radio code, he gets permission from Dernitz to, to do a rescue. And he says, I don't have time to ask who's Italian, who's English. I'm going to rescue everybody, and I need help, so I'm going to put the call out for any other U-boats to help me. So two other U-boats come and help him, and who are they? Eric Verdeman and Harrow Schatz. So there's three involved, our guys. We couldn't believe that our guys end up in this strange affair. And so they're pulling up whole boatloads of survivors right onto their U-boats. And Verdeman writes, you know, we had British women and children on board. We gave them tea and blankets. But he said it, it kind of hurt our morale. And I wondered why. And in the diary, he said, it's making our sailors think of their sisters and daughters and wives. And um, then the odd thing happens. The U-boats, all three are crowded with survivors. Here's U-506, Ferdinand's U-boat. And an American liberator comes by, and Hartenstein had made it clear over the radio, over and over, in English, that I'm rescuing everybody. I declare this a neutral site put a big red cross on his on a sheet. And um, we know in our research that the Americans knew what was going on. But for some reason, the Liberator got the orders, bomb the U-boat. 
And so they did. They bombed uh, Hartenstein's U-boat. Many of those people were thrown into the water and perished. Uh, there were a lot of sharks attacking people there. And we don't know why. We've, we've since made every kind of effort we could to find out, well, why was that liberator ordered to bomb? We don't know why. Vertiman's U-boat, this one you see here, was never bombed. And he wrote, after a two-day period, we were able to transfer these people to a uh, what they call the, the Vichy French, the ones who were working with the Germans, to a ship controlled by them. So uh, a, just a weird incident in World War II. His fourth patrol not going well, uh, 143 days at sea, and he only sinks two ships compared to 10 in the Gulf of Mexico. And it's because we've gotten so much better. We, we're using blimps to spot subs. We have um, sonar on our destroyers. Our radar is working better on our aircraft. It can pierce cloud cover. It's working well at night. And the Liberator uh, crews are getting very effective into, into how to bomb a U-boat. And again, it's almost like the stars aligned for this book. Normally, when a U-boat sunk, you just know, you know, the depth charge of a bomb hit it, and it goes to the bottom of the sea. You don't know what happens on board. In this case, Eric Verdeman and five others happened to be on the top, above the conning tower, where they have their deck guns, when the Liberator comes out of the sky towards them. So it happens off the coast of uh, Spain and Portugal. And um, the reason that he got caught was he had mechanical issues and had to surface in the daytime, which is a, you know, you're putting yourself at great risk. And the Liberator is now so efficient that they know how to really sneak up on the U-boat. And what they would do is, and this is a quote from one of the Germans, they'd come out of the sun so the Germans on lookout, you know, with the binoculars at the sun, it's hard to see, and it's too late when the Liberator comes. And amazingly, at the British, I think they call them the British National Archives, we were able to find the photographs of Verdeman being bombed. And that's the basically the direct hit by the American uh, airman. His name was Lieutenant Somme on the, the Liberator that bombed. U-506. And so normally you don't know the story, but in this case, there's the oil slick at the top of the screen. In this case, because Verdeman was either in the, the passageway to the upper uh, level, and so were some crew members, there were survivors, and those are little dots in the oil slick, and two men are holding Verdeman up because he's injured. But there's waves, and they're all coughing and gasping. And finally, Verdeman realizes the two men are going to die if they keep doing this. And he says, let me go, let me go. And they do, and he disappears. So it's amazing that we were able to, to find the last, what happened the last hours of Eric Verdeman's young life, because those two sailors were rescued by a British destroyer, brought on board, brought to Great Britain, interrogated, and just by the working the internet, we found a British historian that was able to track down the interrogation reports. And so those two survivors are the ones that said, Ferdinand's last words were, let me go, let me go, and we did. And then what happened to the family? Well, remember I said um, the dad wanted to join the service. Well, after he survives, he really wants revenge. And you'll read at the tail end of the book how it, it really kind of splits the family apart in some respects. He's probably suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome himself. Uh, he joins the Coast Guard to get revenge, uproots the family. They really need to go back to San Antonio, Texas, their home, but he says, no way. They end up in um, St. Augustine, Florida, and a couple other Coast Guard bases. 
And then people say, whatever happened to Sonny when you read about his ordeal? I said, well, Sonny, you know, Sonny's story wasn't over with this happening. He, um, he grows to be quite a man, six foot six, and becomes the all-time leading scorer at the University of Texas in Austin, and then gets drafted into the NBA. Uh, so he's got quite a life story, and um, it was interesting. I said, did you play against uh, anybody famous in college? He said, oh yeah, Bill Russell. I said, what was that like? Because I'm a basketball fan. And he said, well, the reason I hold the record at Texas University is I could shoot left-handed and right. I was ambidextrous. I used to play against my dad and my brother. And he said, Bill Russell was the only one in midair who could switch from blocking my right hand to my left. And he said he was just quick as a cat. And um, he goes on to, to have quite a life. And that little eight-year-old boy is now, I think he's 84 and lives in Quincy, Mass. And here he is today, he's still working. Uh, every now and then he comes when Allison or I gives the program and he'll get up and talk. And it's amazing to hear it from him because even after all these years, uh, whenever he talks about his mom's survival story, his voice cracks and the, the tears start. You know, it's just, a, he was just perfect, the perfect kind of person you would want to work with, never embellishing the story. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, and then now we'll, we'll open it up to, to Q&A. It could be about the making of the movie, uh, so close to home, working with Bernie and Andy and Richard. Irvin Mask had passed away before uh, I had started work on the book, so he was the one rescuer from the finest hours we did not interview. Yes, he mentioned Dernitz, the, the, the head of the, the German Navy eventually. His son was lost on a, on a submarine. And interestingly, Dernitz was a submarine commander in World War I and was captured by the British. I don't think he was prosecuted for this during the war period. That, you know what? Uh, yes. I'm repeating this for the videotape, but he asked about Dernitz during the Nuremberg trials and the prosecution. Uh, you know, he was not executed, and uh, some American top-ranking mil military people spoke up in his behalf saying he's the one German who did have a code of, of conduct, and the one time one of his men did do something wrong, he was, you know, disciplined. Uh, for it. So, you know, he did time in prison, but he was released and he went on to write his memoirs. So when we talk about Dernitz in there, it's because we had his memoirs. Is that American that ever limits? I mean, Dernitz wasn't doing anything to us, but I wasn't doing this Japanese. Did you hear that? This gentleman clarified it better. He said one of the people who spoke up on behalf of Dernitz was Admiral Nimitz, who said Dernitz wasn't doing anything to us that we didn't do in our warfare as well. That I, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Japanese code of conduct was very different. They would, it was brutal. The gentleman was discussing the code of conduct. We, we found many cases in the early part of the war where say the Germans sank a, a ship of ours and um, Schatz did this several times. He would raise the U-boat next to whoever was in the rescue boat, and then he'd go, in perfect English, he'd go, sorry about that. <laughs> he'd go, it's war, here's some water, and in the case in the Gulf, he actually gave him a cake with French writing on it, because it was from Lorient, and uh, would you know, tell him this way is land, and then he'd, he'd leave. So in the early days, the code of conduct was really kind of chivalrous in some respects and then deteriorated, but never became anything like uh, what was happening on the Pacific. Yes? What happened to you? They asked about, well, what happened to the, to the Downs family. The, the hardest part was the dad's obsession with, with getting revenge. And 
the family needed to kind of get back home and didn't. And so it became a source of friction between Ina and Ray, and they actually ended up in divorce, uh, which shocked me because they've gone through this incredible tragedy and all four make it when most people on the Heredia perished. And um, uh, Ray said, Ray is Sonny's, real name is Ray, Sonny was his nickname. Uh, Ray said um, that uh, Lucille had a, had a tough life. And I said, why? And he said, I think she suffered from some depression. But he said, you know, her life might have been in a total different trajectory if a couple things were different back then. And I said, what? And he said, she was a better basketball player than me. If women were allowed to get college scholarships back then, she would have been able to go through college. Her whole life might have been different. It was really eye-opening uh, to hear him discuss that. Uh, because he had a full a full ride through college. Yes? How long after the Pendleton event did uh, Bernie stay in the Coast Guard? Oh, many years. He made it a career. Interestingly, he's just about to retire. They ship him to Vietnam. He would not talk about what happened over there. I said, I'd like to put it in the book. He said, forget it. He, he could be cantankerous at times, but other times you just had to get his trust. That's what I later learned from his daughter. Because I kept saying, why did he turn me down in the beginning of doing the book so many times? She goes, Mike, he was testing you. He used to call me and say, this Togus guy is still calling. <laughs> and the last question, way up there. Well, they, none of them made the Coast Guard a, a long career. So they, the th she was asking about the three other rescuers besides Bernie. You know, they would say, not Irvin Mass, because again, he had passed away before I could interview him, but the other two said, you know, we had our, our 15 minutes of fame, and that was it, and went on and had lives outside of the Coast Guard, and that um, they, uh, they, they had different opinions on the rescue. Richard said, I had complete faith in Bernie getting us over the bar. Andy said, this was no successful rescue, and I go, what do you mean? He goes, Mike, when I close my eyes, I try not to think about it, but every now and then, the face of Tiny Myers comes up because he was just two feet away. He said, I had him. And he goes, you call this the greatest rescue. I don't, and sometimes I can still see his face. So they, they went on to lead lives that never discussed this again. Bernie was kind of made the recruiter for the Coast Guard almost, you know. he. Everybody knew who Bernie Weber was, and he said, I hated it. He said, I could not stand being labeled a hero. It was a burden in my life. And he said, that's why I turned you down the first two, three times about the book. I just didn't want to go there again. So really an interesting take that a hero could become a, a burden. But I'll, I'll take more questions. I'll do a book signing here. You can do all your Christmas shopping. And I, I want to thank the library and the society for having me and hosting Allison and I. Allison O'Leary's here, the co-author of So Close to Home. We'd be happy to take questions over here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.